the last time we were here, we did the presentation of the gospel according to the Bible and the presentation of the plan of salvation according to the official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. Before and we finish with the authority of the priest and the magisterium of the church. Let's pray and then we will continue today from where we left last, last week. Heavenly Father, again we cry out to you for your mercy upon us, upon the ones who hear this videotape and this message that my Lord, my Father, and my God, that they will not hear any negative criticism or retaliation or anger, but that they will hear clearly the gospel. We do not try to offend anyone, but we would like to glorify our God and our Father who is looking for his sheep all over the world. That he came, those that he came to redeem. And we pray, my Lord, that with this message, you use this as a tool to find some of them. It is in the precious name of the Lord Jesus that we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Last week, I wanted to say the date in which the purgatory was declared as an official doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church under dogma of faith. Are those big words? Dogma of faith is something that the Roman Church will like us, or will like the Roman Catholics, to do in order to attain salvation, to believe in order to attain salvation. Before 1439, where the Purgatory was made official and dogma of faith in the Council of Florence, 1439. The Purgatory was not officially dogma of faith. So that meant that before that date, you could or you could not believe in Purgatory and that would be okay. But after 1439, Anyone who does not believe in purgatory, even if they believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior, they still will go to hell. They will be condemned. That is the difference between just any doctrine and the doctrine that is dogma of faith, that one must believe in order to be saved. Those doctrines of as dogma of faith, uh, and those doctrines are included the infallibility of the Pope, the Immaculate Conception, the, uh, the indulgences, and many other things that are essential for the uh, Roman Catholic to believe. We are not going to say that without proving that with their book on the official doctrine of the church. And I hope that by the end of this uh, series, I will be able to introduce to you all the dogmas of faith and all the doctrines that were introduced in the Roman church year by year from the year uh, 300 until today. Uh, this might be a very interesting document to have in order to present to anyone 
who would like to know more about the official doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church. Last week, and I see that there are some new uh, people here, uh, last week we finished by saying this, <clears throat> that in the Roman Catholic Church there are three authorities. And according to uh, John Paul II, who signed this document, and uh, here is the signature of the Pope, uh, signed this document as the doctrine for the entire Roman Catholic Church in the entire world. He said that there are three authorities in the Roman Church. Those three authorities are the Bible, the traditions of the Church, and the magisterium of the Church, which includes the Pope, the councils, the bishops, the cardinals, and especially the priest, which is the uh, incarnation, to, to use that word, of the magisterium of the Church, the authority of the Church. This catechism says that these three authorities are equal and none of these authorities can stand without the other. And specifically is said that the Bible cannot stand as an authority alone. For the Bible to be authority has to be in agreement with these other two. Obviously, last week we said that when three authorities are equal and that there are differences between two of them, the question that we had is which one do you follow? So there were discrepancies between these three authorities. For instance, this Bible says that one is saved by faith. That faith is a gift from God. So therefore, it says that the Bible is the supreme authority exactly from the lips of the Lord Jesus in chapter 10 of John. It says, this is the word of God and the scriptures cannot be broken. The tradition says, and it says that salvation is by faith, by trusting in Christ alone. The catechism says that salvation is by baptism of water and then by repentance and by faith plus works. The Bible doesn't say that. So there is a contradiction between these two books. The question is which one of these books you follow. The magisterium of the church itself has changed and has given statements from different times contrary to the ones that they gave before. And, and many of these are in contradiction to the Bible. The Bible says that the only infallible, holy Father is God. The magisterium of the church says that there is only another one who is holy, father, infallible. Which one do you follow? So, when conflicts arrive, especially by the year 1854, then in 1870, the Pope was declared to be infallible. And when you have an infallible pontifex in Rome, then the infallibility 
in matters of faith and morals will dictate which one is the supreme authority. So, we finish by saying that the supreme authority in the Roman Catholic Church is the magisterium of the Church. And here you have this, the supreme authority is the magisterium and the Bible and the tradition traditions will have to submit to the authority of the magisterium of the church. For us, the authority is the same, as I said last week. But it is this way. Where the Bible is the supreme authority, and therefore the statement of the Reformation, sola scriptura, indicating that the Bible is the supreme authority. The tradition also has authority. There are things in the tradition, particular words that are not in the Bible. For instance, the word Trinity. It is not in the Bible. But since the Bible teaches about the Holy Trinity, the tradition that indicates the word Trinity is valid because it is under the authority of the Scriptures. Does the Church has, have authority? The answer is yes. God has given authority to the Church. Authority to exercise the functions of the Church. As, uh, authority to exercise the discipline of the Church and so on. That authority is valid only when it is under the authority of the Scriptures. So, <clears throat> we presented the Gospel last week in this way. Salvation, the plan of salvation established in the Holy Bible is by faith alone. We were dead in trespasses and sins, serving the principle, principle of the air, which is Satan, doing our own will according to our flesh under the wrath of God. I am citing Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. And by nature we were under the wrath of God. But then, <clears throat> in verse 4, it says uh, of uh, Ephesians, the beautiful word, but. But God, who is rich in mercy, for the great love that he loves us with, when we were dead in trespasses and sins, he gave us life. And then he says, because by grace you had been saved. That is the grace, that's the mercy. Through faith, faith is the gift of God. And this is the work of God, not of your own. So will no one will glory themselves. By faith, uh, by grace, through faith, and in Christ. And the Bible claims that Christ is the only mediator and the only redeemer between God, for men, to make peace with the Holy God. And Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father but through me. And then Jesus is established in the New Testament as the only high priest, the only priest 
that can save to the uttermost. We finished last week with some of the work of the priest in the Roman Church. The tradition of the Church and the doctrine of the Church indicates that the priest has the authority to forgive sins. The salvation of the Church is done very much by the intercession of the priest. And I will be dealing tonight with the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ compared to the priesthood of men. The priest in the Roman Catholic Church is very much in charge of the salvation of the individual. The person is born and the priest will baptize the child. When the child sins and comes to the uh, age of accountability, the child goes to confession to the priest. The priest gives him absolution and now the child, the child is safe. child is safe until the child sins, comes to the priest, the priest gives absolution and the child is safe. And then when the child sins, he is back here and lost, so he goes back to the priest and the priest gives him absolution and the child is safe and the Roman Catholic spends the entire life depending upon that absolution to be able to be safe. It is very, very, very uh, sad when the Roman Catholic doesn't know where he goes or she goes when she dies. We, we talked about it last week. When you ask a Roman Catholic, where would you go when you die? And usually 90% of them will say, I don't know, but I hope that I will go to heaven and I will know definitely when I'll get there because really the Roman Catholic Church teaches that you, must, you are saved by faith in Christ but not only faith in Christ plus the works that you do and if you do good works and die being absolved you are going to purgatory and then to heaven. And if you die with any mortal sin, you go to hell. If you go to die with venial sins, or sins that you forgot to confess, then you go to purgatory where you approach your sin burning in purgatory for many, many years. It's interesting that the Lord Jesus that came to give us the message of salvation and the knowledge of eternity. He spoke about heaven and he spoke about hell. He did not say a single word about purgatory. And some of the question is, did he forget? Is something essential? And then when you look into the Word of God and you don't find purgatory, then you discover that the real reason is because the destiny is to. If a person trusts in Christ alone for his salvation, that person goes to heaven. If the person doesn't trust in Christ alone for his salvation, that person goes to hell. Now, one of the problems that the Council of Trent and the doctrine of the Roman Church has with this is that they said, say that easy believers won't take you to heaven. And we agree with the Roman Catholic Church. We agree on that. The fact that you say with your mouth 
that you believe in Christ and continue to live in sin, that will not take you to heaven because you have not believed in Christ. If the person believes in Christ according to Romans 10, 9, you believe with your heart and profess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior. And the Holy Spirit takes possession of the new Christian and that new Christian does not want to sin anymore. And we can see it clearly in the same book of Romans, chapter 6, when Paul says, now that you are saved through faith in chapter 3 of Romans, by grace in chapter 4 of Romans, by the death of the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 5 in Romans, now you are good to go. And the Apostle Paul says, shall we... Chapter 6 of Romans, verse 1. Shall we continue to be in sin so grace may abound? What's the answer? By no means. And that is the answer that we have to give to the Roman Catholics. To understand that when you believe, you are going to hate sin. And then when you sin, you repent immediately. And that is a good signal that you indeed have believed and trust in Christ. It is very important for us to say this, not only to the Roman Catholics, but for to so many people who claim to be Christians and live like the devil. Because they have not gotten it. See? And that's why Romans says, when you come to that point, in Romans 8, you say, now, when? Tomorrow? Now. There is no condemnation for whom? For those who are in Christ. And now, where did priesthood came from? The priesthood was established by God. And it was established by God in the Old Testament. The first priest was Mr. Aaron. Remember him? He was consecrated priest. And what was the office of the priest? And all the priests in the Old Testament came from the tribe of the Levites. All the descendants of Aaron. In fact, Aaron had three children that God killed because they offered their wrong sacrifices to the Holy God. Then, the priesthood continued to be from the line of Aaron, of the Levites, all the way to the New Testament. What did the priest do? The priest was in charge on the Day of Atonement to offer sacrifices to be the intercessor between the people of God and God. And on the Day of Atonement, people will bring animals that are blameless, without any blame, calves and lambs and other animals and bulls. And the priests were supposed to take the blood of those animals that will represent the coverage for the sin of the people there of Israel and will move through the veil into the Holy of Holies. And only the priest could go there. And there was no, in the book of Hebrews says, there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. So, 
those animals were taken by the priest and only the priest could be the intercessor. Only the priest could go through the veil into the Holy of Holies. It was so serious and so sacred and so holy that they tied a rope to the feet of the priest, to one of the foot of the priest. In case that the priest will die there, no one could go there. They will have to pull him out. That was the priesthood of the Old Testament. And it is all in the book of Leviticus. And it was created there as a shadow of the New Testament, as a shadow of the priest and the sacrifice of the New Testament. Let me tell you, before the priest will go there, he will have to ask, he will have to make sacrifice for his own sins. And he will have to have the blood sprinkled on him to be clean of sin. Because every priest was a sinner. And the priest will offer blood of the animals. Those priests will have to be replaced because they die. Out of every, every 90 priests, only 90 die. Did you get that? <laughs> All of them die. So we needed a priest that will not die. <clears throat> Here comes the New Testament. And we are going to go today through the book of Hebrews. So if you have your Bibles, uh, it will be good if you accompany me on this trip through the book of Hebrews. Because we are going to demonstrate how the priesthood of the Old Testament was replaced by one priest in the, Old, in the New Testament. When the Lord Jesus appeared in the New Testament. And by the way, the book of Hebrews is the book of the better things. And the book that demonstrates as clear as possible the changes of the old covenant to the new covenant. Changes in the demonstration of the plan of salvation. Let me make a little parenthesis here. The plan of salvation in the Old Testament is the same as the plan of salvation of the New Testament. The people in the Old Testament were saved not by those animals, because year after year they will have to come back and be saved again. But they were saved by looking at the promise of the Messiah. And the Messiah was announced for the first time in Genesis 3.15, when God punished the woman and cursed the serpent after sin, and he said, I will put enmity between you, serpent, Satan, and the woman. <clears throat> you, your seed, Satan, all the pagans, will bite the, the heel of the seed of the woman, which is Jesus. And the seed of the woman will crush the head of Satan in of the serpent on the cross. And anyone who believed in that Messiah then came as, as Moses began to write the first five books of the Bible. Did you want a small information? The Bible began to be written in 1492 B.C. before Christ. 
you probably remember because 1492 was when Christopher Columbus, but it's 1492 when Moses, because we have the age of Moses and when he began to write, and he was the author of the first five books. And Moses continued to write, and even through there he says, and a prophet, the prophet like me, will come, and whoever believes in him will be saved. How do you like that? To announce the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyone who was saved, was saved by Christ alone, by the promised Messiah. And in the New Testament, anyone who is saved has to look back at the cross and be saved also by the same promised Messiah. So the plan of salvation has not changed. Now, <clears throat> when the Lord Jesus walks for the first time, and John the Baptist sees him, <clears throat> he says this, Agnus Dei, Quit all is peccata mundi. That's what he said. Agnus Dei, quit all is peccata mundi. There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's a beautiful welcome to the Lord Jesus, right? Did you want to hear what the Lord Jesus heard? He knew his Bible. He knew what they did to the lambs. He knew that they had to kill animals for the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> All he heard was, there is the animal that we are going to kill to save the people of the world. Wow. He already was looking at Calvary. He already knew what was going to happen. There is, sounds pretty, right? Agnus Dei, Quitolis, Peccata Mundi. And he knew that he was going to be the new priest in the New Testament. And he knew that he was going to be the priest and he was going to be the lamb. That's why when they tried to kill the Lord Jesus so many times, at one point he says, my time has not arrived yet. You cannot kill me. I will offer my life myself. And I will take it again. I have that power. John 8, 9, and 10. I lay my life. What does it mean? It means that he is the priest and he is the Lamb of God that was going to offer the eternal sacrifice once and for all. So, I am not making this up. I am reciting to you the book of Hebrews. Because that's what it says here in the book of Hebrews. And interestingly enough, in the book of Hebrews, it demonstrates a fundamental change in the priesthood. Dear ones and dear Roman Catholics, I plead with you, read the book of Leviticus and read the book of Hebrews and compare the two priesthoods. You are going to find out that the priesthood of men has been eliminated in the New Testament by the only priest that is the Lord Jesus Christ. If anyone knows the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ, he has three offices, remember? His king, he is prophet, and he is what? Priest. So, 
we cannot eliminate that. So, you will see even in the ceremonies that the priest in the New Testament does, the priests, the, pri the men who are priests, are very similar to the priesthood of the Old Testament. And they don't know that those were eliminated in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written precisely because the Jewish people who were converted into Christianity began to suffer a tremendous persecution because they have to leave that religion. They suffered, a, their families did funerals for them. They killed them, they attacked them themselves for separating themselves from the Jewish traditions. And the new Christians began to wave. Say, so, okay, we are going to be Christians, but we still would like to go to the temple. We still would like to have to declare faith in Christ and still have circumcision just in case. We are going to declare our faith in Christ, but we are going to go to the temple and offer sacrifices from time to time. And the writer of Hebrews, which Dr. Sproul says is Paul, I hope he is right. <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews says, no. You can not have anything beyond Christ. It's Christ alone. It's not Christ plus the sacrifices of the Jewish tradition. It's not Christ but plus the temple. It's not Christ by, plus the priest. So they began to weigh their faith and wanted to be still under the traditions of the Jewish people. If for salvation, let me clear that, you go to Christ plus something else, you are not going through anyone, you are going through hell. Because it has to be Christ plus zero. Christ plus nothing else at all. Otherwise, Jesus is not telling the truth. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one, zero, goes to the Father but through me. And he kept saying that all through the Testament, through the uh, um, Gospels. He says, I am the door. There's no other door. I am the light. I am the bread. I am the only way. Not that plus the Jewish traditions. Interesting enough, God destroyed through the Romans, through the general Titus, under Titus, the temple in 70 AD. And today, the Jewish people are still crying in front of the West Wall, begging God to restore their temple. And when I was in Israel, I felt sorry for them. I did not understand exactly this part. I said, I wish God would give him back the temple. And somebody hit me and said, I thought you were a Christian. He cannot restore the temple. You know why? The temple is seated at the right hand of the Father. It cannot be other poor temple. The destruction of the temple began when Jesus said, all has been completed on the cross. And what happened? How the destruction of the temple began? By ripping the veil from top to bottom. 
The most sacred place was destroyed first by the blood and the body and the plan of redemption executed upon the Lord Jesus Christ on the day of atonement, the day of the crucifixion. Isn't that amazing? It's, it's, it's amazing. So, the book of Hebrews, along with the book of John, Romans, Colossians, Revelation, the first chapter of those books, is the description of the Lord Jesus. Introduces who is this Jesus. And in the book of Hebrews, and on the first page, actually, it says, <clears throat> um, it says, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Uh, he says he is the exact representation of the Father. He says, through him all things were created. And the same thing in John. Nothing that had been created had been created without Jesus. And so on. In chapter 2, uh, this says in verse 17, Therefore, in all things he had to make him, and no, therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. That is in chapter 2, verse 17. What is he talking about? Talking about is that this is what happened. And I don't like to repeat what I said last week because we will never finish. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's John 1. John 14, the most powerful and the greatest miracle that can ever exist was performed. And the Word became flesh, received the name Jesus, and lived among us. Why is the miracle? An infinite, eternal, all the divine attributes of God in a little baby, in a man. And he says, up from that moment on, we have a new priest that has two natures. Is human enough, with the power enough to carry our sins and to suffer like us, to understand our trials and tribulations. And at the same time, God. So that's the big difference. Man and God. And it says, therefore, 17, in all things he had to be made like his brother, that's us. That he might be merciful and faithful, what? High priest. Is introducing Jesus, the Son of Man, the man God with the two natures to be the high priest he might have and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people ouch I can stay here for one hour we don't have the time but propitiation and expiation Propitiation, he, we have offended a holy God and an infinite God. No one, no priest, no human, no water, no fire or purgatory has, a purgatory, not even hell, has the power and the merits to pay in full to the holy God for our sin. And that is the word propitiation. 
to pay back to God. But the infinite blood of the same God is able to do that, to do propitiation. And then to do expiation is to put our sin as far away, as out of us, as the East is from the West. That's magnificent. Now you can begin to see the priest, the, the, the priest in the New Testament. Then in chapter 3, verse 4, it says, therefore, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession. Who is that? Christ Jesus. What part of that priesthood you, we do not understand? He's, he's changing the priesthood of men for the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. You can see how the comparison begin, and even Moses appointed Aaron as a priest by order of God. Now God is going to appoint Jesus on the order of Melchizedek, which is the same Jesus in a Christophany at the time of Abraham. And we will get there, God willing. Then we have, you see how the priesthood of Jesus begin to appear? In a book of the better things. Verse 14 of chapter 4. See then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. If you believe in him, this is not a priest that just passed through the veil. Look what he did. He passed through the heavens. <laughs> There's no comparison. Jesus, the Son of God, let us all fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but we, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. This priest did not have to do sacrifices for himself, to purify himself, because this priest was human like us, and yet without sin. And that's why he had the power to pay in full for our sins. If he was human only, like the other priest, he would not have enough to pay for himself, let alone for us. It's, it's probably a blasphemy what I said. Maybe not. <laughs> Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Look at that magnificent thing. Before this priest, no one can go boldly to the throne of grace. Only the priest. But now we can. We can confess our sins to that priest. And that confession is extremely important, and I'm going to make a little parenthesis here since I mentioned confession, for our dear friends, Roman Catholics. Confession by men, and I say this with authority because I was going to be a Roman Catholic priest, is very dangerous. Because anyone who doesn't fully realize that salvation is through faith in Christ and that that faith that makes you a child of God will hold you back, will protect you from sin. And when you sin, you repent to the point that you don't want to sin again. But when you go to confession and you are assured that you are forgiven, you, go, you are safe 
for a few hours or for a few days, and then eventually you sin. When you sin, you have to wait until Saturday to go to confession. So you are already condemned. The idea is that nothing can stop me from doing more sin, because in any event, on Friday I have to go to confession. I am not saying that every Catholic does this, but it's a tremendous temptation. I knew Catholics, and I have plenty of friends who are Catholics, and in the book that uh, the Roman Catholic Church wrote uh, about me says that I am fair when I speak about Roman Catholicism, that I am not, but I know sufficient Roman Catholics, and when I was in college, and when I was in high school, and this, where we say, we have already seen, let's keep going back, and waiting for that Saturday to come to get absolution. That only demonstrates that the person has not faith, that the person is not a child of God, he is still under control of Satan. And by the way, the Bible says that you should confess your sins one to another. No, to an, they, they, they never assign pastors. And we will get there when we get to the work of the pastor to, to, to hear confession. But it's one to another. So, if anyone goes to confession, when you finish telling your sins to the priest, then ask the priest to exchange places and the priest will have to tell you your sins because he's confessed your sins to one another. In any event, and confession is good to, sh to let somebody know, help me, I am in trouble. Pray for me, I hold you accountable. Chapter 5. For every high priest taken from uh, five one, every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. We are talking about what is happening in the book of Leviticus, in the priesthood of the Old Testament. He can have and, 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 and this priest could have compassion upon the people because he has a man. But he, um, as Aaron was, that's, that's the last word in that, in that part of, the, uh, of chapter 5. But the problem is that I can have plenty of compassion, but if I don't have the merits to pay for your sin, I cannot make propitiation for your sin as a man. That's why in verse uh, 5, it says, So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, Who made Jesus a priest? His father. He said, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Ouch. Now we are changing the priesthood. You know why? Melchizedek did not belong to the tribe of the Bites. Melchizedek did not belong to any tribe. So there is a change of priesthood radically because it, comes, is, it is beginning to come, the new priest, uh, from another uh, tribe. Um, and it says in chapter 6, verse 4, now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth. This is talking about Melchizedek of the spoil. And indeed, those who are not the sons of Levi who received the priesthood. So this Melchizedek was not from the tribe of Levi. 
And God is saying, I'm sending you a one priest to replace all the priests who is from the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. Never was a priest outside of the tribe of Levi. But now you have this one. Who is this? And then uh, in, in verse 12, Uh, pardon me, why am I going for uh, Verse 19. This hope in Christ we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the, in the, the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, here comes the chapter... Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't do anything. Chapter 7 is the meat of it. I can't believe I wasted all this time. Chapter 7 is the introduction of Jesus as the High Priest. Can, can we do 10 more minutes? We have 7.25. Let me see how much we can do in chapter 7. Let's do. In verse 12, it says, For the priesthood being... Do you see that word that is there? Change. Change means... Change is <laughs> not the same. The, we cannot stay in the priesthood of men. Of necess necessity, there is also a change in the law. There are no more animals, no more sacrifices, no more veil, no more intercession of men for men. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated in the altar. It's a new priest, new tribe. Verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord arose from what? Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. That indicates is a radical change. Then, um, then in verse uh, in, the, in, the, in verse um, 12 it repeats what he said before God changed that priesthood and assigned his son you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek for on the one hand there is an annulling do you see that? Others, other Bible says, set aside, changed, destroyed, what? The former command of priesthood because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect, perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing of a better hope, a better priesthood a better hope, through which we draw near to God. But he's saying, we do not draw near to God through a priesthood of men, but to, through a better hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. Nine, number 20, and as much as he was not made priest without an oath, For they had become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord who has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. <clears throat> Dear ones, God has said here already three times to Jesus, You are the replacement of the priesthood. 
forever. Why can't we believe him? It's God talking. But it's more. 12, 22. But so much more, Jesus has become a surety of what? A better covenant. Better than the priesthood of men. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, the Lord Jesus, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to say, to say it to the uttermost. If I were you, I would underline that word. <laughs> Look at this. A priest today says here to here, he has to go back and do it again and again and again. This one is to the uttermost, forever. You never have to come back for forgiveness. And let me clarify that. When you trust, or when we trust in Christ alone for our salvation, we are forgiven forever. We are declared saints. We are declared justified. We are declared not guilty forever. And when we ask again for forgiveness, it's not unto salvation, it's repentance. Do you understand that? Okay? But forgiveness unto salvation is once and for all. Uttermost, those who come to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. Do you want, any one of you would like to be a priest? If you want to send me an email, please. Or send an email to the Vatican. And you say, I want to be a priest. And we are going to send you the requirements to be a priest. And you have to send in that email your curriculum vitae. And these are the things that have to be included in your curriculum vitae. Ready? Let's go for it. Verse 26. This is your curriculum vitae. Any man who wants to be a priest must fulfill this curriculum vitae. For such a high priest was fitting for us. What do you need to be a priest? Holy. Any hands? Harmless. Any hands? Undefiled. Never seen. Separated from sinners. Separated from the world totally. Pure. Any hands? and has become higher than the heavens. Who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices for, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did, Jesus, once for all. When he offered up himself, He's the priest. And what did he offer? The Lamb of God himself. For the law appoints as high priest men who have witness. But, the beautiful B-U-T, the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. This word perfected doesn't mean that Jesus was not perfect. It means that through his obedience, he became the perfect sacrifice, like the Lamb of God. I think I have bored you for all this blah, blah, blah. And many of you, including my Mimi, is saying already, no, hey, what's the point? What is the point of all of this that we are talking about? Do you want to know the point? 
Please read the first verse of chapter 8. Now, this is the main point. What is it? Of what we have been saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. That tabernacle is the temple. Wow! All of, and of course, I think that we have to finish next week with the priesthood because we only just began. It's a song like that, right? <laughs> I have to finish always with a little story. Can I? When I wrote my dissertation of the comparative study of the official doctrine of the Roman Church with the Holy Bible, the Roman Church wrote a book about me with the same title except a question mark. And somehow this book arrived in Utah. Utah? Utah? Utah. Yeah. And a priest called me from there. He says, I need to talk to you. And I said, I could not, I don't have time. You know, I'm going to make the story short because the time is gone. I don't have time. And Mimi says, why don't you give him at least one hour, two hours? He says, he's not going to fly here for two hours. And I said, I only have two hours. He says, I'll be there. He's a priest that had been a priest for 20 years, doing his doctor's degree in there. He flew into Philadelphia, and through a series of events, he arrived like 10 hours late, because the planes were all over. So his two hours were over. But I decided to spend time with him. And the two hours turned into almost two days. That on Saturday he arrived. And we didn't say anything. He was so motivated about salvation and about whether we are doing the right thing. And he specifically, as a priest, if he was doing the right thing. And all we did was to carefully read the book of Hebrews. A little cup of coffee here, a little cup of Colombian coffee there, and we read, that's a commercial. <laughs> and we read the book of Hebrews. When we arrived in chapter 10, he began to cry, took his collar off, threw it on the floor, stepped on it, and he said, I am an imposter. I cannot take the place of the Lord Jesus. I can't. The next day, we went to church, and in that, it was a small church, and when they saw this man that came there for the first time, they asked who in the, in the Bible study, in the study, Sunday school, say, who is this man? I said, he is Father, oh no, I'll let you introduce yourself. And he says, I am Father, he says, I was Father so-and-so until yesterday. And discovered that cannot be another priest. It's actually sinful to think that there is any man or priest that can replace the Lord Jesus Christ. And today I heard the gospel for the first time. And I confess clearly that I trust in Christ alone for my salvation. And I never have to spend hours and hours anymore in the confessionary to gain my salvation. Because this priest got it for me to the uttermost. There was not a single dry eye in that congregation. That fellow went to South America and now is studying at the seminary with us. 
but it is an amazing, or he has already started, it's an amazing, amazing story of the grace of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask for forgiveness for the running over time. Will you protect us from sin? Will you give us more grace to trust in Christ alone? Father, we pray for every priest out there, not only in the Roman Catholic Church, but in the Orthodox Church, in the Hindu Church, and in so many religions where they have priests without knowing that there is only one who has offered the sacrifice once and for all. We pray for them in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.